Um, thank you all for joining me. This is going to be a history of parchment and paper. Um, it is as much as I have found to this point, but as we know, um, history is one of those uh, growing things. So I don't want to say that it is the definitive history, but it is a history. Um, so my name is Elena Weth. I uh, was admitted to the Order of the Laurel uh, this May. My primary focus has been parchmenting, Middle Eastern pigments, and illumination. I am actually from the kingdom of Anstiora, the barony of Lac Solier, and I have my little map there. Mundanely, it is south of Houston, Texas, uh, United States. So, um, mundanely, I am also a, a high school teacher. I just made it through year one, Ray. Um, so, I can and will talk a lot about the things I am passionate about. Um, parchment is one of those loves for me. But I do want to reiterate that if anyone has a question at any time, please uh, feel free to jump in and interrupt. Um, I, I want you guys to feel that this is an interactive, hopefully not boring lecture. Um, but yeah, I cannot see the chat, so I appreciate you for um, helping me out on that. So we will go ahead and get started with parchment. So what exactly is parchment? There's this quote from Clemens and Graham, it's Introduction to Manuscript Studies. It's a textbook, it's, it's a really great introduction to manuscript studies, where Clemens and Graham say that parchment is literally the substrate upon which all virtual knowledge, which virtually all knowledge of the Middle Ages has been transmitted to us. So that's really beautiful and flowery and absolutely true, but when you get to the nitty gritty, parchment is animal skin. It's animal skin that has been prepared to make the surface accept and retain ink and pigment. Typically, parchment is made uh, from calf, sheep, or sheep or goat, but I will get into some other animals. Um, and parchment can vary greatly in quality. Uh, not only can a skin's coloration change the value and quality of a page, but as an animal ages, the skin can become thick or scarred. Um, so if you think about, um, like, to, to be a little morbid because it's midnight where I am now, if you think of the skin of a baby versus a skin of a teenager versus a skin of somebody older, our skin is a, it's a living, growing organ that changes over time. And it's the same for the animals that we slaughter for food and for parchment. So the younger the animal, the better the quality of the skin. So what's in a name? Here is the tiniest of soapboxes and a hill I will die on. Um, a little bit of etymology. If you're interested in etymology, I have a much longer spiel on my website, which I did not um, appropriately plug early on, but all of this information is on my website. Um, the, the term parchment is derived from the old French uh, with records as early as the 12th century for parchment, which I don't speak French, so I apologize for butchering all of the words I'm about to pronounce. Um, that term was derived from the Latin pergamina, which dates back to 636 CE, and it, that translates to of or belonging to Pergamon which I'll get into in just the next slide. What's really cool is that everybody was pretty much calling it some permutation of parchment or pergamina, except the Anglo-Saxons. In Old English, they were calling it buckfell, which literally means book skin. And so now I need an alternate name that's, that involves book skin, buckfell. Um, but they eventually gave up the ghost and fell in line when Old English became Middle English and um, went to parchment, so 14th century. The other term you will often hear is vellum. Vellum is Latin from, for vitilinum, which again, mispronunciation is me, and the French vellin, which is of calf or made from calf. So parchment is kind of your tissue to vellum's Kleenex because vellum is specifically cow. However, as if very, very soon after this term shows up, um, it also comes to mean just any parchment that is of good quality must be vellum. Um, so you will see a lot of interchangeability with parchment and vellum. And like I said, I've got about two pages of that on my website, if that's your bag. 
Um, not everybody is that interested. Um, but vellum shows up at around the 15th century. I forgot to mark that on this slide. So what about pr prior to parchment? So, you know, we've got 636 is when parchment is showing up as a word, but what happened before then? We have written stuff that was on papyrus. So papyrus was used as early as 3000 BCE. And the way papyrus is made is you take the stem of the plant and it's very similar, the plant itself is very similar to an onion. You cut off the outer layer and then you have these inner layers and you kind of open them up and you overlay them like a 16th of an inch, pardon my like not metric measurements, um, over, overlap them, hammer them into place. The sap in the fresh part, uh, uh, papyrus is going to make them stick together. So once you've got that layer, you do a second layer perpendicular. So at a 90 degree angle, pound that down. And that's how you get, that's how you get papyrus sheets. Um, sometimes they would use a flour paste to help the layers stick together. Papy the problem with papyrus is that papyrus is almost exclusively grown on the banks of the Nile in Egypt. So Egypt's kind of got a built-in monopoly on, on papyrus. Enter Pergamon and library envy, because when it really comes down to it, the only reason we have parchment is library envy. At least that's what Pliny the Elder says in, uh, in his natural histories. I've just so, had a, a question there. Uh, absolutely. What, what flower paste would be used if known? I do not know. Um, I admit a kind of very cursory knowledge of papyrus making, and I have shared all of it with you. Um, I just know that it is a flower paste. Um, because that's what Wikipedia and the citation said, and I believed it. There's actually, uh, the University of Michigan is actually where I got that information. The University of Michigan has a full um, website on making parchment and um, has an online exhibit that was from, I believe, 2004. I've just had an additional uh, question to that. Is that Flower as in a petaled object which smells prettily, or flower as so. in the uh, powdered wheat? So, I'm pretty sure that it was flower petal flower, but now I, now I, now I don't know. Now I wonder if I just auto-corrected wrong. Anyway, I'll look it up at the end. Um, but uh, I wish I could see the chat because I can s oh, here we go. Uh, End of the roll. I don't see it. I'm not seeing very quickly, so I will find it and I will come back to you. I'm pretty sure I copied that line exactly from the uh, University of Michigan website, so it was probably flower petal flower. Um, so, back to library MB. So King Ptolemy of Egypt. Uh, Ptolemy, he he was ruling Egypt. He was you know he's pharaoh. He's got. The Andrea, which is the library we all want in our um, heart of hearts. And to the northwest in Pergamon, which is modern day Turkey, there was King Eumenes II. King Eumenes II was known as a guy who would go and raid towns for their libraries. Like people would, like these villages would bury their books so that he wouldn't get them. Like he was, he was very keen on building a library to to exceed the Library of Alexandria if he could. Um, and he actually went to Egypt and he tried to woo the head librarian away from the Library of Alexandria. And that really pissed off uh, King Ptolemy. So King Ptolemy said, nah, -uh, put an embargo on papyrus. He said, okay, you're cut off. You don't get any more papyrus. And when that's the only thing that, uh, like, but I say books, but it's essentially these tomes, these rolls. When that is your only method of, of collecting information, you've got to come find another way. So the story goes that he found another way, and that's how parchment was born. However, it's like, well, actually, um, well, that is a really fun story that Pliny the Elder tells us. 
Um, we have accounts from five centuries earlier. So King Eumenes and uh, Ptolemy were second century. Five centuries earlier, we have um, the Greek, um, Greeks of the Ionian tribe were using animal skins to write down information. We have animal skins written, in e written on in Egypt as far as uh, 2550 BCE. Uh, 2400 BCE, we have a Book of the Dead that's written on animal skin. The difference is that these were like tanned hides that were hardened and written on. And what we believe Eumenes did was perfect that, perfect and remind and refine that process. So when you process, and I will, and I get to this in a couple of slides, but when you process parchment, it's the same as, parch as, as leather until it's not. And the biggest difference is the introduction of tannins. Tannins are what give uh, color and leatherness to leather as vegetable tannins. And that's why it's called tanning the hide. When you take out the tannins, when you take out that process, you have parchment making. It makes the materials, um, instead of having a give in the materials, it makes the material, materials stiff and white. Um, and then when you draw it taut, you have that, that material, that substrate that we know of as parchment now. So by the end of the first century BCE, parchment was gaining in popularity. We have animals are just, they're easier to come by than papyrus, the plant. Um, it's much more forgiving and flexible in use. With, uh, with parchment, you can use all the little off cuts as tags and labels. You can use both sides of the surface. One of the problems with papyrus is that it is a fairly sheer material and um, it was not very easy to use both sides without bleed through. And um, that also helps with legibility because our parchment is fairly opaque. Yes, that's what I need. Um, and also you don't have the texture of papyrus messing with your nib as you're writing. And mistakes are also much easier cor to correct. With parchment, ink and, and pigment kind of, they lay on top and then affix as opposed to soaking in like they do with paper or with papyrus. So you can take a pen knife or just a, a knife a scalpel sharp object and scrape off that layer and the skin is um, supportive enough and it, it handles the scraping and then rewriting which is what how you get the palimpsests which I'm, I, I'm in the next paragraph of. So oh I moved too early sorry about that. So by the third century CE it became the dominant writing material so it took about you know 400 years. Um, between the seventh and ninth centuries that's when you start seeing the recycling of parchment begin. And that's uh, the palimpsests, where they would essentially just scrape off everything that existed before and reuse it. Luckily, we can still see a lot of what is written, what was originally written on palimpsests through UV light photography. There are several different uh, methods of seeing, that's just one, uh, but it's really cool the information that we are regaining through um, this sort of imaging. So parchment, it's made of what's for dinner. Um, so the deal with parchment is that it is made of the animals that they were eating regionally. So while I said early on that it is predominantly made of calf, sheep, or goat hides, we do know that other animals have been used, such as horse, rabbit, deer, and squirrel. Uh, most modern spectroscopy readings are indicating that a deviation from these three sources is pretty rare by the 13th century. And there's kind of a bit of a division, and this is very Eurocentric, and I get into that in a moment, but calf and sheep skin were mostly uh, used in England and France, while goat skin is mostly used in Italy. Um, and it really does come down to goat was eaten far more often in Italy, so they had that more abundantly available. So there were two quotes that I pulled from a source uh, that I really liked. And so I've included them here. Um, in my skin are the prayers and all the blessings made to the Holy Church, says one monk. 
And the other says, and have not calves, goats, kids, conies, hares, and cats skin? As vellum, ah, see, see, vellum, they may be well written upon. To be sure, their parchment is worth more than your skin, which serves you less. It's like, that's a little bit of monkly shade for you. Um, I liked this quote because it also indicates the different types of animals. And then it shows that, uh, that use of the term vellum to meaning more than just uh, cow parchment. And then we also had a 10th century text from Cordova, Spain that, mentioning, that mentioned parchment from deer and gazelle. So I thought those were really cool. It's kind of neat to see that they were, there were the top three, but they were branching out. They were using what animals were available. And I do believe that a lot of what animals were used were also based on what was happening as far as drought or um, shortages. So there was a study and I have referenced it earlier and here, uh, Fidiman et al. And I've seen uh, the article, or at least one of her two articles get posted about um, and shared about in SEA circles, which is awesome. She did a study of 72 Bibles, 220 folios, which was a, a total of 293 objects from the 12th to 14th century as uh, Roman spectroscopy readings. There were five Bibles that she tested multiple pages on and show, that showed different animals within that codex. And that could be an issue of combining two works or just simply using different parchment. So that's one thing we don't necessarily know is if they're like, uh, these two look good enough, we're gonna stick them together post period or if they just literally like, Here's your 10 sheets of parchment, have at it. Um, the, this, uh, to reiterate, the parchment was reflective of the livestock that was available. And that parchment was able to be processed to a very fine thickness, regardless of species. It's likely that the age of an animal at the time of slaughter determined the thickness rather, um, rather than necessarily it being uterine or abortive vellum. That's one thing that I go into in a little bit of detail on my website and I didn't in these slides. Um, the idea that th there was no um, industry for um, aborted fetuses for parchment, but stillborns or very young uh, animals would have that same quality and they would get this term uterine vellum or abortive vellum uh, but really, it's just very young animals have this very buttery, soft skin that's very fine, very um, almost sheer. It's really lovely to work with um, and work on. So what the Fitment study found is that it was probably an age, not like the animal was born and died young as opposed to the animal was never born. Like that's what I'm trying to get to. There we go. I took a wandering path. So a tale of two recipes. So on the left, we have the Luca manuscript, Codex 490. It is the first recipe we have for parchment making. As you can see, it is incredibly in depth in that way that you don't want anyone to do that thing that you're doing and making money on, because it is literally how parchment is to be prepared. Place the skin in lime water and leave it there for a few days. Then extend it on a frame and scrape it on both sides with a sharp knife and leave it to dry. While it's not wrong, it leaves out one or two steps. On the right, we have what some call the, the uh, Theophilus recipe. It is actually a 15th century addition to one of his it's a tw so Theophilus Presbyter is 12th century um, writer, and he wrote on diverse arts. He wrote a few things, and in his in the book Harley uh, 3915 British Museum, on one of the kind of pages in the back, there's a gloss from seemingly 15th century that gives a more in-depth recipe for making parchment. And this gives you like how long you should have the water, have the hide in the water. So you, you soak the, the hide in water for a day and a night. Essentially you're, you're rinsing out all the dingleberries and the dirt and the whatever from, and the blood from the animal. 
then you put it in a lime solution. And there it says old lime. And what we found is that, and here's where I'm going to get into more detail than I probably ought to, so I apologize. Uh, sorry, not sorry. But um, we found that old lime has it helps the breakdown of the epidermal layer. So what the lime solution does is it breaks off the, the layer that's holding onto the hair. So it breaks that up. And if you're using an old solution, there's bacteria in there that makes that go faster. It stinks more, but it makes it go faster. So that's why it says to, to use old lime and water. It's going to form a cloudy liquid. The thing with lime is that it's hydroscopic. It does not fully dissolve. So you have to mix it um often you mix it every couple of hours for the time that it's in in the vat um so this is you know two to three times each day leaving them for eight days and twice as long as winter i can say that in living in Ansteora, we usually do it about five days because the temperature is what makes that uh difference and we have actually found that when the solution reaches about 95 degrees um, it will actually dissolve the hide faster than it just that layer and you get this weird like Thanos effect. It's kind of gross. I don't suggest it. Do we have questions? No? Okay. Um, so you withdraw the skin, you unhair them. So you put it in a live solution to get that hair off. So then you, you're flopping the hide onto um, a beam, you scrape the, the hair off. It should come off very easily. Like you don't even need a tool, you can just use your hands really. Um, and then once you've done that, you rinse the hide again um, until, ooh, sorry, I moved the thing, until all the hair is off. And then you wanna make sure that you scrape off any of the fatty bits or, or anything that may be left. You tie it onto the frame um, usually with pippins, which are little rocks tied to the frame, you stretch it, you use a lunellum, which is a round knife, and um, you essentially scrape it until it's thin, until it's uh, a very white color, you let it dry. Your dry time is going to matter, it's going to depend on your humidity level and your, your heat, like how hot it is at home. And then you take a pumice stone, and essentially sand it, smooth it down, cut it off, cut it into sheets, and you have parchment. Um, so I kind of went off script there, but it, making parchment is one of those things that I love to do. So if you ever want to talk about how to make parchment or you want to get into it, hit me up. I, I will talk you off about it. So, Understanding a little bit of how parchment was made, it's, it's good to also understand the parchment would have been made where livestock was slaughtered. And again, I keep harping on this, it's it, depending on what was being slaughtered is what your parchment was going to be made of. Hides are only going to be good for a short period of time because of essentially rot. Um, salting would have been prohibitively expensive in Northern Europe. Um, so they were, they were processing what they were making right away. Nowadays, um, I know that the, the parchment uh, folks in England, I know they've got like a big seller of salted hides. We can afford that now, but at the time they couldn't. Uh, some issues to take into consideration are humidity levels. Um, with high humidity, you get kind of floppy bacon parchment, which does not, um, it's not conducive to, to taking paint or ink. With very low humidity, it becomes very hard and brittle and that can actually make uh, your painter or uh, ink pop off. Because like I said, unlike with paper, your, your paint and your ink are kind of laying on top. So by the 15th century, Cennini not only discusses how to use parchment, but he also lists method, methods of tinting it uh, for colored pages such as green, purple, blue, or peach. And that's um, essentially by tinting the size or, or uh, tempera, essentially painting a fine layer of color on it, which is really fun to do. I know that with ink, if you want black paint, uh, black to do like a black hours, if you just take iron gall ink and just brush it on straight, it absorbs enough and it sticks and it's, it makes a beautiful color. 
The only thing with any of these colored pages is that you cannot scrape um, as well because you will scrape off that top layer of pigment that you created. But could you then re-dye it? Very likely, but and it's not something I've put uh, put a whole lot of uh, time into yet. It's it's a, a newer area for me. I would worry that you would end up with that kind of patch look where there'd be like a little bit of of over dye if you're trying to recolor just a small area. So if you're going to write or illuminate over it, it probably wouldn't be a problem. Um, it's just something to kind of watch and consider. All right, so that was that was parchment. So did I have any questions about parchment for jumping into paper? Uh, yes, there is one. Did purple parchment come from the Byzantine area? <sighs> I know that there are, that's a, I would have to look into it uh, because I know that there are purple books from that time frame, but uh, Byzantine moved to, paper fairly early on. Um, so as far as par purple parchment, I would have to look. Um, I, like I said, I know it exists. Um, we've all seen those gorgeous, uh, gorgeous manuscripts with it, but I'm not sure about the exact origin. All right, half an hour on paper. Okay, we can do it. So paper! It all started with a eunuch. So Kai Loon. So this is another one of those fun story times that, um, well, actually, probably, probably didn't exactly happen this way. But so Kai Loon, he's this court eunuch. Um, he was of extremely high status at the turn of the second century uh, CE in Han Dynasty China. He'd actually served several different royal families. Um, there was inviting and and. You know, people dying, other people taking over, and, and lots of court intrigue. It's a really cool story. Um, but he managed to maintain, and in, in fact, he managed to rise in status despite all of this uh, royal shuffling. And he had some estates. So while he was lounging in his estates, in approximately 105 um, CE, he created a pulp mixture, which was the inner bark of mulberry trees mixed with rags, hemp, and rope bits from old fishing nets. So he took these bits and he macerated them. So he pounded the heck out of them and then kind of like floated them in water, racked them, like took a, a screen that was framed in bamboo and let it dry and discovered paper. And for his discovery, he was rewarded handsomely and the government converted very quickly to paper. Um, he was, he was known throughout the empire. So despite the story of, of this eunuch who created paper, it is very likely that, again, he refined the process. There are several examples of paper that were primarily hemp-based prior to his experimentations that date back to the second century BCE, so 400 years prior, 300 years prior, four, two. Numbers are hard at midnight. Um, second century BCE. So it's believed that this story persists because of his status and because he really did refine the process by mixing the other um, bits in and creating a, um, a finer material. That's why, like, that's what made the empire shift over to paper. And that's why he is lauded as the inventor of paper. Like he's got a stamp and some statues. He's got all sorts of stuff. So paper had regional appeal. So Korea was invaded by China in 109. So four years after the invention. Um, Korea took back control of their country by the 150s, but they kept a lot of what China left them as far as civilization and technology including paper. In fact, Buddhism was uh, the driving force to the production of paper, ink, and brushes because it helped them proliferate, proliferate their faith. And by the third century, 
China had made contact with Japan. Now, at this time, Japan was developmentally in the Stone Age, but they caught up quick. Um, so interplay, interplay between these three nations, Korea, China, and Japan, um, led to Japan invading Korea by 370 and held on to Korea for about two centuries. And paper was made in Japan for the first time at 609, after four Japanese students came back from studying in China. So these three countries, a lot of interfighting, but paper became a big deal for each of them. And it pretty much stayed there. So on this map, I have Luoyang. That's where uh, Kailun was from. And then Korea and Japan. So the, Luoyang was kind of the center of, of things during this time period. And paper was really exclusive to this area for about six centuries. Enter Islam. Um, things became very different after um, the um, Arabs discovered paper. And that happened because of a small battle in Talis. So paper moves west. So much like the invention of parchment and the invention of paper, um, there's another fun story that probably didn't actually work this way for how the Middle East got paper. Is the 8th century. China has been trying to move west, trying to collect all this territory, and it finally comes to a head at the Battle of Talus, where they are soundly beaten, never to try again. Like, this was the end of the road for China. They're like, okay, we're done. We, we are happy with the territory we have. You know, give or take. Um, so 751, this battle happens. Now there are some Chinese prisoners of war who beg for their life, saying, we will teach you how to make paper, just don't kill us. And that is how the Arabs gained paper. Now in reality, we have paper finds in this region as early as the fourth century, um, but it's again really believed that it was after this battle, and we do believe that there was interplay with Chinese prisoners or that helped refine the papermaking process, which really made it take off in the Middle East. So the Abbasid regime, they're the ones um, who are fighting the Tang dynasty at this point. They had actually moved their capital from Damascus, which is over towards Cairo, to Baghdad. And with it, that writing material change was solidified. Prior to this, they had been recording all of their core documents on papyrus or parchment. Once they moved, papyrus was really expensive to import. And parchment could be manufactured in Baghdad, but the manufacture of parchment is a like time-intensive process. Whereas paper is a very, it, it doesn't take a lot of time to actually create paper. And that's what really pushed the shift. Um, Khalif Harun al-Rashid al -Rashid opened the first paper mill in Baghdad during his reign. And that's, so it's like 762, the, the move to Baghdad. And then within 20, 30 years, paper mill, and you're done. Once you're, once you're, you know, once your Khalif says, we're doing this, everybody does this. So they became the center of the paper universe. The thing to understand about paper, though, is that it requires water. So you couldn't just go anywhere in the Middle East and make paper. Like, you have to have a very good water source for all of this to work. So there are four major centers of production in the Middle East, and I've got them highlighted in yellow. The Samarkand, Baghdad, Tiama, uh, and Yemen. And shortly after those four, Damascus and Bombix um, also began to make paper. And it's interesting because those two had like specifically named papers that were known in Europe. Um, Charter Damascene, Damascene. Um, so paper from Damascus was known as like the highest quality you could get. And then Charta Bambacina, which literally translates to cotton paper. And because it literally translates to cotton paper, 
the folks in Europe thought it was literally just cotton paper. So when they created their own uh, paper out of rags and, and other bits and bobs, they thought they were creating a whole brand new thing, which I'll get to it in about four or five slides. But at this time, paper was largely a mix of things, including cotton. One of the big differences between the paper of the Chinese and Arabic paper is that it was beaten rags. Um, they were they really were the first to create rag paper. Um, they had the water driven. They developed water driven machines to help pound the rags against uh, stones instead of having to rely on manual labor, which sped up the process immensely. Um, another difference was their size, and I'm not talking about small, medium, large. It's the sizing. It's a glue from a lichen is what was used in China, whereas the Arabs created a starch from rice and wheat. And essentially it's, it's a paste that you put on the page um, that helps do magical things to it. This is the extent of my paper knowledge, I apologize. Um, but I do know that it helps um, with the coloring of the page and it also helps everything stick together Ink also had to change. Um, parchment ink tends to have a higher acidity and that can eat through paper. So the scribes evolved to using a lap, lamp, lap, lamp, there we go, lamp black ink. Um, so a carbon-based ink. And they actually borrowed that idea from the Chinese. So paper beats papyrus and parchment, still has a problem with scissors, however. Papermaking eventually reached Cairo in 900. Egyptians had been using paper for about a century um, before they developed their own mill. They were really, they were not wanting to let go of their monopoly, but they realized they were fighting a losing battle. And they actually stayed in the papyrus, oh, words are hard, you guys, papyrus production through the 13th century, and it was actually largely the um, Arabic Empire that was keeping them going. So it wasn't even their own use of papyrus that was keeping them going, it was um, the Arab empires. Um, and so while we have this really early adoption, it wasn't until about 1000 that we start seeing Quran written on paper. And it is believed that that was um, because it finally reached a high enough quality. Uh, in the beginning of, of the paper proliferation, there was significant pushback um, from Muslim Jews and Coptic Christians um, that you shouldn't write, uh, write the holy book on anything other than parchment because parchment was known to last. Like parchment is difficult to burn. Like if it gets wet, the stuff still stays. So it's, it's a tough material. And we all know that paper is not. But about 1000, the process refined well enough the quality was high enough that it was considered suitable. And that's when you see um, Christians and Muslims both allowing their holy book to be written on paper. And here's where I talk about writing all the things. So in the Middle East, they wrote down all of the things, so many things. Um, it, paper was really instrumental in the exchange and collection of information between cultures. Um, like you had families who were writing down everything about their families. You had like court reports, court, court poetry, who was getting, who was having flings with whom. Um, fields of, of study started developing such as math, medicine, history, and literature. Um, the House of Wisdom was established in the ninth century to encourage the study of Greek texts and Indian mathematics. And that's where we get um, the adoption of the Hindu numerals one through nine, as well as zero and base 10. Um, there's also, oh no, I, moved, I pushed the button. I, I touched it wrong. Sorry guys, where did I go? There we go. Um, so we also have studies on distillation. And uh, what I thought was super interesting was that libraries in Europe were usually 400, 500 books. Like that was a big library. Whereas Arabic libraries were usually thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of books. And it's because the substrate was so much cheaper, you could collect, so you could 
find more, collect more information, and you had it. Um, and that's why advancements in the Middle East were so much like ahead of what was happening in Europe. Because you can you can make your population literate if you can pass around books. Um, so it's it's a it's a really cool thing that it that happened, and I truly think that paper was a major push for that. And that's my bias. So I will step back. Um, but it is really cool that we also have cooking. Uh, they were writing down oral literatures. One thing that the uh, the Persian Empire, when the Persian Empire realized that they were on the way out, um, they started writing down everything, all of their histories, all of their poetry, all of their everything to try to retain their culture because they knew that the Islamic Empire was going to come in and overtake them. Um, so we still have a lot of that information. And um, it's because paper was a thing. So Morocco... Al Andalus and Zatvia. Oh my. So we are now on the other side of our map, more towards Europe. In 670, the Arabian Empire invaded Morocco. And this area, they adopted Islam, they uh, learned Arabic. And it's cool because in Morocco and really in all of the Andalusian area, they adopted those things, but also kept their previous cultures. So they're a really interesting mix there. Um, the Al-Andalus region lasted for 800 years. The Andalusian library had 500,000 books um, and they advanced irrigation, philosophy, theology. They had written musical notation, um, official histories. Also, ooh, I, keep, I keep trying to scroll, sorry you guys. <laughs> Um, and they started using Arabic numerals, which were actually Hindi numerals. Um, and it was around 1150 that paper was first mentioned as being made in Europe in um, Zakvia, which I could again be mispronouncing poorly, um, which is near modern day Valencia. Uh, Fez in Morocco also developed a paper mill around the same time. And it's said that the Jewish-run mill in Zatvia was the finest paper in the Arabic world. So there you go. Um, 1150, that's when paper mills start kind of clawing their way into Europe. Not without uh, difficulty. Where, what am I talking about? Okay, I've got 15. Um, so Europe resisted for reasons, and most of those reasons are racism. Um, paper was known to Europe before this time, obviously, like they, they knew about it, they knew it existed, they were using it, sort of, um, but there wasn't a rush to convert because it was a product of the Arabs and then of the Jews. There was an abbot, Peter the Venerable, in 1141, he's like, God reads the book of Talmud in heaven, but what kind of book? Is it the kind we have in daily use, made from the skin of rams and goats? Or is it from the rags of old cast off undergarments or rushes out of Eastern swamps or some other vile material? So there's this assumption that you're using old underwear and, and like gross materials to make paper and you would never want to write your holy book on it. And obviously that was, that was an, a concern early on, which is why Quran wasn't written until, you know, process was refined. Um, but the old underwear line makes me laugh because what are you going to do with threadbare material. Even if it was underwear, it's threadbare material. You, you make it rags, and making rag paper out of it is, is, the, is a next logical step. But the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II also declared all official documents written on paper instead of parchment to be invalid in 1221. Um, and some of the, the official documents written on parchment make sense. Like we said, it, it lasts, it is durable, um, but it was really interesting that they were making edicts. They were like, no, seriously, we don't like paper. Stop trying to use it. Stop trying to make fetch happen. But it did. Um, this was really the beginning of the end of the parchment era for Europe. Because eventually capitalism happened. They realized they could make money. Um, once, in 1244, Zadvia was under Christian control. And that's when Europeans finally decided, hey, maybe paper's not that bad after all. Uh, they realized that it was a very cost-effective material, um, and they perfected the watermark. So when you screen, when you're, you, you have your pulp and it's floating in water, if you put a widget, a metal widget, 
on top of the screen and then screen your pulp onto it, you get the impression, that watermark. Watermarks are a European invention. And that was what further differentiated European paper from Muslim paper. So you want to use European paper because you know it's blah, 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 racism. Um, but religious and racist qualms were kind of quashed once they realized that they could make money um, on paper books. 1440, the final nail in that coffin, is when Gutenberg introduced the printing press to Europe. Uh, by 1470, the presses were throughout Europe. Handwritten books were on a major decline. What's really interesting about the Gutenberg press is that he did develop a press for both parchment and paper. But the thing with parchment is that it had to have a special ink because of the ink not soaking in. So it took a much longer time to print on parchment than it did to print on paper. And that was really why they were like, all right, guys, we're done. We're done with the, the parchment. Relegate that to like the super special things that nobody cares about or that you only care about and you want to last for centuries. Everything else, let's do paper. Um, so parchment did stick around for a while, especially for book binding, um, but it really declined to the 17th century and now there are only like two or three places that, that commercially do parchment, whereas paper, paper factories are all over the place. So that was a whole lot of me talking. These are a good chunk of my resources. Again, I have these on my website as well. If I've said anything that makes you go, huh, or you see a like a site you want a little more information on, absolutely reach out to me. Um, I can, this is my website and my email address is elanaweth at gmail.com. I'm also on the book of faces as elanaweth. And so you can find me that way as well. You gave this uh, slideshow to the steward. It should be up on the... Not yet. Oh, not yet? It was okay. created, like, today. <laughs> so, this is normally I give a handout and I talk to folks and we chat and it's great. So it's been very different. I had to, like, really, like, sit down and think about the process. So, of course, I put it off to the last minute. Well, if you keep that up there, the links huh? will, will stay up for a little while. So you can like send it to the steward next week. Absolutely. But yeah, I can't find the little chat screen, so I guess it's behind my oh. presentation. But yeah, if well, if you stop you stop sharing. There it is. There it is. So oh, see all the people who are filling in the bits that I needed. And we've got ten minutes to go. So does anyone have any last questions? Oh, any questions from where any tiny little bit in the talk? Um, the Islamic paper you were saying, um, which was the best or considered the best? I'm sorry, say again? It, you were talking about Islamic paper and you said one was a better one? It's, it was mostly just the, the assumption that uh, paper from Damascus was the best. It may or may not have actually been, but that was the... Um, that was the understanding at the time. And then paper from Zativia, Zativia, the like names of me, I am a, I am a writer, not a talker. Zativa um, was also said to have been excellent quality paper. Have you come across any silk paper? I have not, I but I read silk? about it briefly in, uh, in my brief dive of uh, China is that that was that once they had the refined process from Kailun, they um, relegated silk and one other paper or one other substrate to an every now and again special cases thing. But I, I did not allow myself that rabbit hole, not yet. Yeah, Basilin with the with the a great resource. Um, I used two main resources that I used were um, a book called Book and a book called Paper <laughs> by Keith Houston and Mark. Uh, yeah, Mark Kurlansky. Uh, Kurlansky is also the guy who wrote Salt and Cod. Um, but they're they're also both really good books on uh, the process of and the history of book and paper.
is an headache. Food. Oh, thank you, Basil. I see I, see I had misspelled Al Rashid, and I will fix that in my slide thing now so that I don't send off a wonky thing. But yeah, so I've been making parchment since late 2015. So that is my my biggest, like, that is the love of my life right now. But um, I am very lucky to have a friend, um, Master Barar and Trimeris, who is going to be making paper with us at uh, the next Gulf War. <laughs> so if anybody's ever to make, a able to make it over, Come join us for parchment and paper and papyrus. We're going to be doing papyrus as well. What are they going so to be making shameless. the paper from? Uh, rags, linen. Now I've got to find where that. There we go. As just a question there from Margie. It doesn't matter what sort of rags are used. Uh, no, not that I can tell. Um, and that's, again, kind of out of my knowledge because I haven't made it yet. Um, but I know cotton was used. I know that linen was used, hemp. Um, so I imagine that, I honestly imagine if they were making clothes out of it, they could make, and I know that silk paper existed. So I think that if they were making a clothing out of it, it could be beaten into a mushy mess and paper made out of it. Plant fibers, I believe, are probably the extent. Um, I know that um, like in Tibet, they would use palm, like they would just dry out palm leaves. Um, and those are some really cool books that are um, bound together with like a hole in the middle. But yeah, I haven't seen anything about um, non-plant materials for paper. I do know that um, paper making in the Middle East, they would um, put in gold flecks as a like a material in with, but that was an addition to um, along with Ebru and other coloring. They did, they did a lot of paper coloring and I realized I did not mention that here, but that is a thing that they did. Like I mentioned the paper coloring or the parchment coloring, but not the paper coloring. Paper paper did a lot of they did a lot of paper coloring. There's his name. Elaine actually yes. asked um, when paper started being made from wood pulp rather than rags. Yes, welcome. I think it was post period. Um, that I would have to look deeper in. Oh, well, you know what? I was going to look up that papyrus thing, too. Let's see. And I can I can link those things, too. So here's papyrus, but because I didn't get that into my bibliography. That was my last second, like, oh, hey, that's a cool thing. Uh, 1765 looks like... No. Yeah. Some of the earliest examples of paper made from wood pulp include works from um, Jacob Christian Schaefer in 1765 and Matthias Koops in 1800. So um, yeah, pulp, uh, wood pulp is post period. All right, well, we've got three minutes to go till uh, the end of the event for today. So are there any last questions from anyone? Yes, Maggie. Um, I've just had a look at the papyrus making link there and it actually says that, uh, uh, I'm just looking to find it again, um, but it says that the, the 
doesn't talk about any additional gummy, gluey stuff. It basically says that the gummy yeah. comes from the cellulose of its own plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now I'm trying to, to figure out, I know that I saw that somewhere because, like I said, I, my, exper my experience with, with papyrus is very, very small. Um, but yeah, usually you didn't need anything else. So I will find that and I will post it um, probably in the event and be like, hey, by the way, for the two people who, <laughs> who are holding on, here's where I found that info. Thank you.